Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Добрый день, добрый вечер всем. Uh, you have opportunity to select language. Так, вы можете выбрать свой язык. Ира, я тебя слышал на английском языке. Uh, я не знаю, блин, как, как в телефоне переключить. Я, я... А меня как переводчика забили. Was, was I selected as a translator because I didn't get the notification? Yes. Sorry. Is there a way I can make it so I don't hear the translation? So I yeah, can... you're not supposed to hear the translation. Daya, yeah, uh, we have. Irina, you are selected as a Russian translator. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? We still hear you. We still Wait. hear you on English channel. Okay, stop. Can you hear me now? Hold on. Let me add you again, okay? Can you hear me now? We still hear you. Wait, wait, wait. I... One second, one second. Good evening, everybody. We having some tech issues. Добрый вечер. У нас небольшие технические сложности. Мы их решаем. Доброго вечера. Вибачте за незручність. Наразі ми вирішуємо технічні питання і скоро розпочнемо наш вебінар. Okay, I think you can proceed, Dana. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Dana Summers. It's a Stanford Child Mental Health Project for Ukraine. And it's my honor to present this wonderful person, amazing professional, Dr. Lauren Moskowitz. And we just were speaking a couple minutes ago how it's symbolic that the last webinar of this year with Lauren and she was the first person who organized a first Q&A with experts in order to help Ukrainian specialists and parents of special needs. So Dr. Lauren Moskowitz is associated professor of State Johns University. She um, received her bachelor's degree from Cornell University and her master and PhD in clinical psychology from Stony Brook University. Her research is focused in anxiety, in developing a um, positive parenting strategy and a helping special needs parents. So please, join us select the language and you can check in the chat our previous webinars it's on a uh, web page of stanford recorded webinars and we have around 19 webinars translated and recorded on english russian and ukrainian and i think um now lauren it's your turn Great. Thank you, Dana. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to talk about treating fear and anxiety in kids on the autism spectrum. Most of what I'm talking about will apply to individuals of any age who have anxiety, not just children, but children is the population that I know the most about. So, so most of my examples will involve kids. All right. But feel free to, you know, stop me if you have questions or if I'm going too fast, if I'm speaking too fast. I'm a fast talker. So if I'm going too fast, let me know and I'll slow down. So just brief background before we get into treatment. Anxiety is actually way more common in kids on the autism spectrum than in neurotypical kids or in kids with other developmental disabilities. Um, some recent research by Connor Kearns um, shows that about 69% of kids on the spectrum have clinical levels of, of anxiety, you know, significant anxiety symptoms. That said, historically and even currently, anxiety is often overlooked in youth on the spectrum because it can be difficult to assess that anxiety, in part due to the communication difficulties that are inherent in autism, right? It can be, um, we usually diagnose anxiety because people tell us, I'm anxious, I'm afraid, I'm nervous. So if 
these kids have communication difficulties, it, it can be hard for professionals to know when a child is anxious or afraid um, if they can't communicate that or if they express it in an idiosyncratic or unique or different looking sort of way. And the other reason it can be hard to assess and is often overlooked is because of um, the symptom overlap between anxiety and autism, right? If you see something like social avoidance, is that social anxiety? Or is it the social avoidance that's characteristic of autism? If you see a repetitive behavior, is that anxiety as an obsessive compulsive disorder? Is that a ritual? Or is it the kind of repetitive behaviors that are characteristic of autism? It can be hard to tease those things apart. And traditionally, um, historically, we always had what was called diagnostic overshadowing, meaning that the autism often tended to overshadow anxiety and other things, right? So that even if a kid was anxious, sometimes professionals wouldn't notice because they'd say, oh, that's just the autism, right? Everything was attributed to just the autism, in other words. But in recent years, it really is being increasingly acknowledged that a lot of these kids are really, really anxious. And so treatments have really been developed to effectively address anxiety in, in these children. Okay, so that's what we're gonna talk about today. So before we really get into how you treat it, just a quick background on what is anxiety. We conceptualize anxiety or any emotion as really having three components thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and that they all interact with each other. That's why there's those arrows right there going both ways. They all have an effect on each other, right? So, you know, if you see someone um, who you know in the street and you say hello to them and they don't say hi back, you know, you might think, oh, they don't like me or they're mad at me. That may make you feel afraid or perhaps sad. And next time you see them, maybe you are not going to engage in the behavior of saying hello again, right? And then the more you avoid them, the more you'll have those thoughts, perhaps that they don't like you and those feelings of anxiety if you do see them. So, you know, they all might interact or relate with each other, these thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, right? And by behaviors, you know, one thing I do want to emphasize is that, again, with kids on the spectrum, it can be really hard to get at those thoughts. We, they might not be able to articulate those thoughts. Even in kids who are highly verbal, um, they often have what's called alexithymia, meaning they have difficulty expressing their thoughts and feelings. Um, so this, the thoughts and feelings might be a bit harder to get at. And often we rely on the behaviors to know when someone's anxious, which can be challenging, right? But behaviors such as freezing, crying, pacing, running away, um, et cetera, or sometimes just an escalation in a behavior. Like if a child's rocking, but they become anxious and they start to rock more vigorously at a faster or more intense pace that could indicate anxiety. And you know, the behaviors are different for every child. You know, crying might indicate anxiety in one kid, but may indicate, you know, anger or frustration or pain or illness in another kid. And even within the same child, crying, for example, might indicate anxiety, but it might indicate um, another state too, such as anger or frustration or pain or illness or sadness, right? So it can be really hard to know based on just the behaviors alone, which is why we really try to look carefully at the context on which those behaviors are occurring in, okay? All right, and one more piece of background, some of the thoughts that might indicate, um, that people typically express when they're anxious or, for example, you know, I'm afraid that spider will bite me or I'm afraid that dog will hurt me or, what if I fail that test and fail out of school? Or what if that person doesn't like me? Or, you know, those are just some examples of some of the thoughts we might think when we're anxious or afraid. And then some of the physical feelings might feel like butterflies in our tummy, our heart racing fast, um, nausea, butter, um, jittery, cold, uh, you know, things, like headaches, just, just for some examples, rigid muscle, muscle tension, right? So again, all of these things interact with each other, all right? Now, what I'm gonna talk about today is what's called cognitive therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. Um, and CBT is really made up of, of three components. Again, you're targeting those behaviors through primarily gradual, gradual exposure, which I'll talk about what that is soon, but also positive reinforcement. 
you're targeting the thoughts through what's called cognitive restructuring. And sometimes, though I don't typically use this, but you know, I'll, I'll address this a bit. Sometimes we target the feelings themselves through relaxation. Um, but um, given that my background is very, very behavioral, and given that gradual exposure is actually the most critical and most important element in treating fear and anxiety, the focus is always on this piece, the gradual exposure, the focus is always on the behavior and to, to a lesser extent, these other things. So my focus will definitely be on the exposure piece. Okay, and we'll be talking about some other things as well. So again, you know, and I'll go into each of these strategies in detail to address all those anxious and worried and afraid thoughts, we do what's called psychoeducation which means just educating the, the person with autism about what anxiety is and normalizing it to some extent. We do what's called cognitive restructuring, which means helping them think about their anxiety in a different way, helping them view things in a different way, um, and really trying to think about coping thoughts instead of anxious thoughts. We address the behaviors through creating a fear and avoidance hierarchy, meaning really trying to think about from easier to hard, um, those things that make a kid anxious, and then really helping them to face their fears. That's what gradual exposure is, which again, I, I have this starred and bolded, because like I said, it's the most important component. You can't treat anxiety without that, unfortunately. I say unfortunately, because a lot of times parents and teachers will say, well, can't we just do the rest, but not do the exposure? Unfortunately not, you know, the exposure really is, I understand it's the hardest sell. Nobody wants to face their fears. If you wanted to face your fears, you know, you, you wouldn't be afraid of it in the first place, right? You wouldn't be avoiding it in the first place. So I, I understand that that part is definitely the hardest, but it is the most important and critical element in treating fear and anxiety. And then positively reinforcing people, rewarding them for facing their fears, rewarding them for doing those things that are really, really hard. And then we sometimes address the feelings component through relaxation, which um, like I said, I will talk a little bit about, but I, there's a lot of reasons I don't often do this and I'll talk about why that is. Before we go on, I do just wanna make the point that CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy is the most evidence effective based treatment for treating anxiety, fear and anxiety in neurotypical individuals without autism, whether that's children or adults. The treatment that has the strongest evidence base by far for treating anxiety is CBT. There's also many, many randomized control trials at this point that show that CBT is an evidence-based treatment to treat anxiety in youth with autism who do not have a co-occurring intellectual disability. Um, so it is an evidence-based treatment in that population, but unfortunately, most of those studies do exclude children with a lower IQ, children with an IQ below 75 or 80, depending on the study. But so those kids with an intellectual disability are, are it, it, CBT is not yet an evidence-based treatment for those children, but certainly the exposure piece and the positive reinforcement, we, we would still consider evidence-based practices. And I will definitely talk about how you would apply some of these strategies with those children who do have a co-occurring intellectual disability or ID, okay? All right, so I'm gonna go through each of these components one by one. And again, these are the same strategies we would use when we're treating anxiety in neurotypical individuals. So first I'll go over the strategies themselves, and then I'll talk about how we would modify them for youth on the autism spectrum, okay? So the first ingredient to treating anxiety is what we call psychoeducation. This is usually the first step we take. Psychoeducation is just a fancy psychology jargony word for education. We're just educating kids or adults about what is anxiety. We help explain what anxiety is in the same way I showed you all the three component model. We explain, we normalize anxiety. We say, everybody's afraid of something. You know, everybody is afraid of something, right? We all have fear and anxiety. And you know what? More than just we all have it, but it's useful. Uh, you know, a certain amount of anxiety or fear serves a function or a purpose. Evolutionarily, we're wired to have some sort of anxiety, right? It protects us. We, uh, kids really find it a bit of a relief when they find this out. 
we say, you know, back in, back in long, long, long ago, you know, if, if there was a lion in, in the jungle and you were in the jungle, you would want to feel afraid or anxious so that you're, you would be motivated to run from the lion, right? You feel that fear or anxiety, your start, your heart rate goes up, it starts pumping fast. It pumps blood to your feet and your hands to your extremities so that you can run away fast from that lion, right? And that's why your heart's pounding fast. And that's why the blood rushes from your head and maybe you feel a little lightheaded and why you're breathing rapidly or hyperventilating because of your heart pounding fast, right? That's why we feel all of those physiological symptoms associated with anxiety because we were evolutionarily designed to do so, right? Um, most of us are not running from lions anymore, <laughs> of course, right? Or, but you know, a certain amount of anxiety helps motivate us. Would I say to my kids all the time, would we ever even bother studying for a test if we didn't even feel any anxiety or nervousness or practicing piano for our recital if there was really no anxiety or nervousness? So a certain amount of anxiety is a useful thing for us to have. It motivates us to action, right? But unfortunately, of course, sometimes people have too much anxiety, too much fear or anxiety, and that impairs our function, right? So what I explain to kids a lot of the time, part of psychoeducation is we are evolutionary wired to have anxiety. We all have anxiety. The symptoms you're experiencing are normal. The problem is your fear alarm, right? Is maybe going off at the wrong time or in the wrong place. Um, your fear alarm, like a fire alarm, is um, maybe not just going off when there's a lion or there's a fire or there's something to actually be afraid of but maybe your fear alarm is just going off when there's burnt toast, right? Your fear alarm is, is a little bit too overly sensitive or too finely tuned. And it, your fear alarm is going off all the time, even when there's actually nothing around to be afraid of, right? So that's what we have to work on, right? Not the fear or anxiety itself, but really trying to um, tell yourself, help you to tell yourself, hey, that's just my fear alarm going off. I don't necessarily have to pay attention to that right now just burn toast, right? So it can help kids or adults to really understand that, okay? Um, part of the psychoeducation is also explaining the rationale for our treatment, um, that in order to really overcome our fears, uh, we need to face those fears and learn how to cope with it and learn how to tolerate that distress, that, hey, it's just a bad feeling. Anxiety is just a bad feeling. It doesn't feel great when your heart's pounding fast. It doesn't feel great if you're a little lightheaded. It feels not great to be anxious, but it's harmless. It's not actually dangerous, even though it might feel really bad. And we can cope with those feelings of anxiety. We don't have to let it rule our lives. We don't have to let it make us avoid things, right? So that's the basic, much longer than that, but that's a very shortened gist of what we do in psychoeducation, okay? Um, one thing I will say, and I'll talk more about modification soon, but for children with autism, again, it's all the same psychoed I do for, for neurotypical kids, but I tend to try to convey it a lot more visually with pictures, with drawings. Uh, this is a page right here from one of the social stories I write children. So we, I think you know, most of us have probably used social stories, uh, which are visual illustrations depicting different situations that are often used for kids on the spectrum. So a lot of the time I illustrate these, the psychoeducation and illustrate um, coping strategies um, in their social stories to again help make it much more visual and more concrete. So then the uh, another element of cognitive behavioral therapy is what we call cognitive restructuring. That's again a fancy word for it basically just means helping us to think about the situation differently. Okay, so challenging our anxious thoughts, you know, do I know, how do I know I'm really going to fail that test? You know, if a kid's afraid they're going to fail a test. I had a child once who was afraid she was going to fail a test and then she'd fail her class and then she'd fail out of high school and she'd never get into college and she'd never find a job and she'd wind up homeless, right? That's what we, that's what kids with anxiety or adults with anxiety tend to do a lot. They really tend to snowball or what we call catastrophize. So the goal isn't to help people think optimistically instead of pessimistically. The goal is to really help people think more realistically, not optimistically, right? Because you know what? 
bad things do happen. You might fail that test. You might fail that test, right? We're not, our job as parents or teachers or professionals is not to tell kids, oh, don't worry, you're not going to fail that test. They might fail that test, you know, but at the end of the day, no matter our, our job is to send the message that at the end of the day, no matter what happens, you can cope with that. With almost anything bad that happens, you will be able to cope with it. Um, the best thing we can do is instill a coping mentality in our children, okay, as a parent, teacher, or professional. So we try to help our kids think, you know, do I know for certain I'm going to fail that test? Or do I really know for certain that spider's going to bite me? You know, what evidence do I have that that spider is going to bite me? Or what evidence do I have that I'm going to fail that test? Have I ever failed a test before? You know, I studied really hard for this test and I've never failed a test before. So probably I, I most likely won't fail this test. But if I do fail the test, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to, you know, fail out of school or never get into college. You know, how bad is that? How, would I be able to cope with it if I failed the test? Yes, I would. Right. Um, so that's essentially what we're trying to do or think about, is there another explanation, right? So remember that first slide when I was showing you the three component model of anxiety, we talked about if you see someone on the street, let's say you have social anxiety and you see someone on the street, like we said, they don't say hello to you and you automatically think, oh, they don't like me or they're mad at me. That could be true. We also try to help our kids think, you know, is there another explanation, right? Maybe why else didn't they say hello back to me? Maybe they didn't see me. Maybe they were zoning out. Maybe they were daydreaming or just preoccupied or worried about something themselves and they didn't say hi to me, right? So, you know, a lot of the times we're making assumptions about things that make us anxious when really we don't know, you know? And even if maybe that person doesn't like me, how bad is that? You know, what's the worst that happens if that one person doesn't say hello to me or doesn't want to be friends with me? Can I cope with that? There's other people who maybe do want to be friends with me and that's okay, right? So that the, that's the essence of what we mean by cognitive restructuring or really trying to challenge our anxious thoughts or think about them differently. I had a, a girl with autism I worked with, a nine-year-old girl with autism once, for example, who was afraid of spiders. And, you know, when I would try to get it, what are your anxious thoughts? What are you thinking? Again, she, she uh, had an average or above average IQ and she was very verbally fluent. So she was able to articulate these thoughts, unlike many of my children, but she was able to say that what she was worried about was, well, what if the spider crawls on me and then it bites me and then I die, right? So again, that's another example of really kind of what people with anxiety tend to do is catastrophize or go to that worst possible outcome, right? So for challenging anxious thoughts, we helped her think about, you know, okay, what's the worst that's going to happen? Has a spider ever bit me before? No, okay. What's the worst that happened? Maybe a spider will crawl on me. But if the spider does crawl on me, what can I do? You know, what's the worst that'll happen? I'll just swat it off, you know? Even if it does bite me, you know, what's the worst that'll happen? I'll put an ice cube on it or I'll put some, you know, hydrocortisone cream on it or, you know, I'll put a bandaid on it, whatever, right? So really trying to, again, ha have her think about, you know, this feared outcome probably won't happen, but if it does, I can cope with it, right? For a lot of kids with, autism, you know, particularly those who have a co-occurring intellectual disability, this kind of cognitive restructuring and challenging anxious thoughts is going to be way too complicated. So for a lot of those kids, we really kind of skip over the questioning and we go right to just trying to teach them coping self-talk or what sometimes we call boss back talk, meaning boss back your anxiety. A lot of the time we give their anxiety a name. If they have a special interest, it helps to give them the name of that of a bad guy or of a villain. So for my daughter, for example, when she loves Sleeping Beauty, we named her anxiety Maleficent. So we would boss back her anxiety or boss back Maleficent. We'd say, Maleficent, you're not the boss of me. I don't have to listen to you. I don't have to do that, right? Um, my daughter now really loves Harry Potter. So we've named her anxiety Voldemort or Voldy Moldy for short. So we boss back Voldy Moldy when, when Voldemort is telling her she has to do something like, uh, you know, if she's scared to wear certain clothes, we say, oh, that's just Vold Voldy Moldy telling you, you can't wear those clothes. You boss them right back and you say, I'm not going to listen to you, Voldy Moldy. I'm going to wear that, that new shirt, right? Um, so that's what we mean by boss back talk. Um, 
again, you know, sometimes even that can be too complicated for kids. So depending on the child's language level and cognitive level, we might simplify the coping self-talk to just be really simple, like I can handle this, right? I can be brave. I can do it. I can fight my anxiety. I've done it before. I can do it again. Now, as I've mentioned, and we'll get to this on the next slide, the most important ingredient of treating anxiety is gradual exposure. That's the most important thing. Um, for some kids with limited language or, 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 difficult, or cognitive difficulties, they may not be able to do this cognitive restructuring. So we might simplify it or modify it or sometimes eliminate it altogether. But the coping self-talk can be helpful in helping a child to want to do gradual exposures in motivating a child to want to face their fears. So that's why we will you know, teach them to say, I'm gonna be brave like Harry Potter. I'm gonna fight Voldemort. I'm gonna fight my anxiety. I can do this, right? I can handle this. I can do this. So the coping self-talk can really help motivate them to do these exposures and to face their fears, okay? So that leads us to, like I said, the most important ingredient of treating anxiety, I will. I can't emphasize this enough. You cannot treat fear and anxiety without this. Often, when I first meet with parents or teachers or even therapists, sometimes they'll say, "Well, do we have to do the exposure?" A parent recently said to me, "Won't this traumatize my child to do the exposures?" No, it will not. Um, the reason we have fear is because we've spent our whole life avoiding the thing we're afraid of. When we confront it, it, it's honestly never as bad as we thought it's gonna be. You know, it's the avoidance over time that maintains our anxiety, right? So when we confront it, think about how many things we anticipate that it's, you know, once we actually do it, it's not that bad. It's the anticipation of it that's really scary, right? So uh, unfortunately, you know, th there really isn't a way to effectively treat anxiety without doing this exposure piece. A lot of the time I have new, we're, um, I might be supervising new CBT therapists who spend many, many, many sessions doing cognitive restructuring, weeks, months sometimes doing cognitive restructuring, because sometimes the therapist themselves can be afraid of doing the gradual exposures. You got to get to this as soon as you can, because like I said, it, the tr it's really never going to get better until you do the exposures. The cognitive restructuring alone isn't going to treat the anxiety. It's just gonna motivate kids to help them to be able to face their fears, okay? But this here is the key ingredient. I can't emphasize that enough, okay? So what gradual exposure means is you're just facing your fears a little at a time, little by little. Learning you can get used to it, learning you can cope with it, learning that most of the time your fear consequences aren't gonna come true, right? I pet that dog and it's probably not gonna bite me. I'm in the same room as a spider and it's, again, probably not gonna bite me. I take the test and most of the time I'm probably not gonna fail, right? Most of the time the things we're afraid of don't happen. Sometimes they do, but usually even when the worst happens, we can cope with it. And so again, that is the message we are trying to convey, all right? Now, when I, the reason it's called gradual exposure is because it, it is not flooding, you know, we are not, if a child's afraid of a swimming pool, we're not just gonna throw them into the deep end, right? We'll help them to face their fears a little bit at a time at the pace that's comfortable for them. Maybe sticking their toe in the water until they get used to it and then sticking their entire foot in up until their ankle, eventually going up to their knee, eventually going up to their waist and eventually going into the water, right? Again, at a slow pace that is comfortable for them. So that's why it's called gradual exposure. Um, we're doing it gradually, helping kids confront these situations from situations that are a bit easier for them, gradually to the situation that's the most difficult or the most feared for them, okay? And at the pace they're comfortable. Uh, again, sometimes parents or professionals are very wary of this because they will tell me, um, you know what, my, uh, a person, you know, my kid was forced to do this thing they were afraid of in the past, it was very traumatizing them. For them. I want to make it clear we are never forcing a child to face their fears. We are encouraging them and rewarding them to do so. We're trying to incentivize them and motivate them to do so, but the control and choice is within them to do so. We are not forcing a feared situation upon a child, right? That's not what we're doing. Okay, so I really want to make that clear. But we're helping motivate children to want to face their fears and by 
using really rewarding things, which I'm going to explain more. Okay. One other thing I do want to say. Um, so there's a few things. The, the old notion of why gradual exposure worked used to be what was known as habituation, uh, meaning habituation is a fancy word for get used to it. So often, again, like I say, if we're afraid of something, the tendency is to avoid that thing, right? Um, so look at this curve here. You know, um, I see a dog. I'm afraid of dogs, right? I see a dog. My anxiety goes up, up, up. What do I do? I run away, up, and my anxiety goes back down. So over time, I never learned that I can get over that hump, that if I just stay in the room with the dog, my anxiety will go high, but I'll ultimately go back down again. And over time, it'll go up and down and go up and down, but I will get used to it. So those peaks will get lower and lower and lower. And over time, I will, again, not feel that anxiety anymore. This model of habituation is still true for a lot of people. But what we do know is, is those on the spectrum actually might habituate a lot slower than neurotypical kids. So in recent years, uh, a newer model has, has, has emerged called the inhibitory learning approach where we don't really put as much emphasis on habituation. So we don't really tell kids anymore, you keep doing it and you get used to it. You keep facing your fears and you eventually get used to it. That might very well be true. They probably will get used to it. They probably will habituate, but that isn't the goal. The goal we really try to instill in kids is um, you can cope with it. Again, not so much that you face your fears and you get used to it, but you know what? Even if you do feel afraid, you can cope with it. Again, we want children to know we all feel anxiety, we all feel afraid, but you can be brave and you can cope with it. That again is the, the message we're really trying to send. All right. Um, so given this newer inhibitory learning approach, when possible, we don't always approach it in this methodical way from easy to hard. Sometimes we will have, we'll make cards, you know, with each level of the fear ladder or the feel staircase. So we might, you know, uh, randomize it a bit. Maybe one day we'll do a two, maybe the next day we'll do a four, maybe the next day we'll do a three. So we don't always go in this uh, very kind of careful staircase approach anymore. But still, I would never start a kid out with the thing that is most scary to them, you know? and it really does depend on the child. So for example, one child with autism was afraid of thunder and lightning. Again, her previous therapist, anytime there was a thunderstorm had had her always putting on headphones whenever there was a thunderstorm. Did that help in temporarily? Sure. But you know, in the long run, she obviously never learned to cope with her, her fear of thunder, right? So what we did was we helped her over time, you know, watching videos of thunder and lightning, um, gradually really watching thunder and lightning from inside a house at first with her headphones on maybe listening to music gradually lowering the volume of it taking those headphones off so that ultimately she moved to the point of being outside without headphones without her hands and her ears be being able to listen to thunder and lightning okay so that's again kind of the model of what we're talking about gradually helping people to face their fears okay so you might wonder, how do we motivate kids to face their fears? Um, that's a tough sell, really, it's a tough sell. So it really all depends on figuring out what is gonna be the most reinforcing or rewarding thing for that kid. Bring out the big guns, I always say. It can't be a little thing, it can't be a little thing. It has to be literally, you gotta save the biggest, most powerful rewards to help them overcome their fear. Okay, so for some kids, it's enough to really just give them points or give them stickers or have them earn brave bucks for doing these exposures. For some kids, that's enough. For other kids, it really needs to be a lot more powerful than that. Um, so for example, my own kids, lollipops is their favorite thing. So I'll save lollipops for the doctor's office, the thing they're most afraid of, right? If your child has a favorite toy or favorite treat or favorite video or favorite activity, that's what you really wanna save for that feared situation, okay? You don't wanna give it to them for other things. You wanna really reserve that so that it's the most powerful tool at your disposal and you reserve it for what they're afraid of. Um, so for example, I worked with a girl recently with autism who was afraid of hair dryers or anything with like a buzzing kind of humming sound. So hair dryers, vacuums, uh, blenders, air conditioners, you know, uh, washing machines, whatever, anything that had that buzzing. So for her, soda and balloons are her two biggest rewards or reinforcers. 
So again, we really had to make it so that she wasn't getting soda for anything else. No more soda throughout the rest of the day. No more soda for anything else. But instead, she would only get soda and balloons when she would be around the hairdryer. And we moved from just being in the same room as the hairdryer while her mom was using it on her mother to ultimately the girl being able to use the hairdryer on herself. Um, at first with getting the reward of soda and balloons, but then once she was sort of over that fear, once she got used to it and she was able to cope with the hairdryer, now we don't use the soda or the balloons anymore. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, feel free to let me know if that's not making sense. All right, so again, use the biggest rewards you have at your disposal to motivate them to face their fears, but you can't use those rewards for anything else or else they will lose their power. You have to reserve those words, rewards specifically for their exposures, okay? All right, um, it's already, I'm realizing we're, we're short on time and this ends at 12.30. Um, I'm gonna skip over relaxation because honestly, this can be useful with some kids, teaching them belly breathing. We don't call it deep breathing, but teaching them to take breaths in, breaths out slowly pretending like they're blowing a balloon or blowing out a candle so that they're breathing slowly. But why I don't always tend to use this and why this isn't my go-to strategy is because sometimes this can become a crutch for children or a distraction and they'll say, oh, you know, am I breathing right? Am I breathing right? And um, they worry a lot about if they're doing it right or, or if they're breathing in the right way. Um, we really wanna send the message that, yeah, this can definitely be a great strategy for a lot of kids in helping them calm down. But whether you're breathing right or wrong, whether you're doing your belly breathing or not, anxiety is still just an uncomfortable feeling. It's not harmful and you can tolerate it. That's the message we're trying to send, right? Although I do want to emphasize that there's some kids who maybe that message might be cognitively challenging to get. So for some kids, they really, really will need something to do when they're anxious, whether that's belly breathing or tightening and relaxing their muscles. Um, I can talk about this more if there's time, but this is another tool or, um, in your toolkit. Um, maybe I will end on, on, on this and leave it for questions if you'd like, but so what are the modifications we would do for treating anxiety in kids with autism? I've mentioned some of these already, but we wanna make, the, we wanna make it a lot more concrete and visual because kids with autism are visual learners. So I try to convey everything I've just mentioned in social stories, in visual schedules, in signs, in videos. I try to convey it all as visually as possible in lists, right? Um, sometimes we will need some extra modules to address ASD specific difficulties. So if we're treating social anxiety, for example, it might not be enough to just do exposures to social situations. We might also need to teach the children more specific social skills so that they aren't actually getting rejected, for example, when they're doing these exposures. Another big piece is we really increase parents' involvement. The parents are very active participants. You can't just, in these original CBT treatments for children, the therapist was maybe meeting alone with the kid and every, every, every few sessions involving the parent. With kids on the spectrum, we've got to really involve the parents in all of it to make sure that they are facilitating exposures and coping self-talk at home, which is really going to facilitate generalization from the clinic setting or from the school to the, you know, the home setting. Um, often we have to focus on reducing our anxiety around uncertainty because uncertainty, you know, can be a big component of the anxiety for any kid, but especially for kids on the spectrum. And then finally, I think the other, you know, and this is general practice for any good practice for any kid, but in particular for kids with autism, they often have really strong special interests, which I heard recently called passion interests. Every kid has interests, but for kids on the spectrum, those interests can sometimes be all consuming, which can make life a bit challenging sometimes for their parents or teachers. But what we find is that incorporating that special interest can really help us get their buy-in when treating anxiety. So like I mentioned, my daughter is really obsessed with Harry Potter. So framing everything in terms of being brave like Harry or fighting Voldemort, um, when she's really scared, I'm trying to help her do an exposure we might make a Patronus for the, pretend to make a Patronus for those of you who are Harry Potter fans. So really trying to take their special interest and incorporate it into every aspect of the treatment. A really good example of that um, 
I'll show you on the next slide here is a good friend of mine who's a psychologist, Dr. Ali Matu, treated a child with autism who had a needle phobia and his special interest was in Legos. So they were able to build a replica out of needle, a uh, uh, build a, um, a replica of a needle out of Legos. So that's an example of what I mean by incorporating that special interest into the exposure itself is very, very powerful and something I do um, with all my kids. Recently, uh, I was treating a child who had a, a dog phobia and this child has a special interest in Paw Patrol. So we had uh, their family member's dog dressed up in a Paw Patrol costume, for example. So that these are examples of what I mean by taking the special interest and incorporating it into the exposures. Um, in terms of the modifications with cognitive restructuring, again, I've said some of this already, but I really try to convey a lot of the psychoed and cognitive restructuring using, vi using visual aids, such as illustrations, or lists. So like for one child, I made a list of, I do this for a lot of kids, brave behaviors, here's the brave behaviors, and here's a list of the anxious behaviors. This was for a child whose anxiety was always that he, a child with autism who was afraid he was sick. Oh, he was always afraid he, would, he was sick. He would follow mom around all afternoon saying, am I sick? Am I dying? Am I healthy? Is my face red? Am I breathing right? Et cetera. So we put those behaviors on the list of afraid things that he shouldn't do and instead made a list of the brave things he could do. And I wrote him a social story explaining how those questions kind of made it, asking mom those questions made his anxiety worse. So to fight his anxiety, he would have to not ask mom those questions. And if he did ask mom those questions, she was gonna respond, um, not answer him anymore by saying, oh yes, you're healthy. No, you're not sick that from now on, she's gonna to respond to you by saying, I can't tell you that, that's just your anxiety. You know, so I'm, to help you fight your anxiety, I'm not gonna answer that question. We actually, this kid loved wrestling, so we named his anxiety the undertaker. So mom would say to him, when he'd say, am I breathing right? Or is my face red? Mom would say to him, that's an undertaker question. The undertaker is asking that question. So to fight the undertaker, I'm not gonna answer that question, right? So again, you're not fighting your child, but you're joining with your child on the same team fighting against their anxiety, okay? Um, in the interest of time, maybe I will stop here because I know that I'm, I should leave time for questions. Is this a good place for me to stop for questions or would you like me to keep going? I believe you can keep going a little bit more. I can keep going a little bit more, okay. So I'll go for another few minutes. You just let me know when I should stop. Just pipe up and say, okay, stop for questions now. And I'm happy to oh, stop. Okay, will do. Great. So what are some additional modifications for kids who are nonverbal or minimally verbal? Um, for kids who are nonverbal or really don't have a lot of language, again, we're really not, sometimes we're not doing cognitive restructuring at all, but sometimes even kids who are minimally verbal can learn a really simple coping thought. So again, we're not gonna be doing any complex cognitive restructuring, like how do I know the spider is gonna bite me or how do I know I'm gonna fail that test or what's the worst that'll happen? That's gonna to be too complicated. So for those kids, we really will just focus on replacing their anxiety with general coping thoughts, right? Like I can do it or I can handle it. Something very, very simple that we can teach the kid to say, right? Um, as a great example, there was a study done back in the 70s to treat anxiety, to treat fear of the dark, I think in three-year-old kids with, who were afraid of the dark. So again, really young kids who didn't have a lot of language. But in this study, in one condition, they made a kind of tape recording, I think, saying the dark's not a scary place, right? Dark's not scary. But in another condition, they made a recording that the children listen to every night saying, I'm a brave boy or I'm a brave girl. I can take care of myself in the dark. That group did better. Why? Because again, you're not trying to convince kids that this thing isn't scary, the dark isn't scary. Rather, you're trying to, again, send the message that you can cope with anything. You are brave. So even three-year-olds were able to learn that simple coping thought of, I'm a brave boy, I can take care of myself in the dark, right? Sometimes that's all you're trying to do. And for kids who have even less language, again, just teaching them to say something simple like, I can do it, I can handle it, I can be brave, 
uh, for the child who had the special interest in Paw Patrol. We taught him to say, I can dino do this, uh, which I think is what they say on Paw Patrol. So again, if you can incorporate their special interest into the coping thought or coping self-talk, even better, right? Um, right, so what some kids will say, um, okay, it's a worry bug and a helper bug. I'm gonna squash the worry bug <laughs> and have them maybe even make a worry bug out of Play-Doh and squash that worry bug. So again, you try to make it visual, try to make it concrete, try to make it tangible when you're teaching these concepts of fighting your fears, okay? The modifications to the exposure, or like I said, we try to incorporate the perseverative interests. Um, it used to be called perseverative interests or, or obsessive interests or restricted interests. Like I said, nowadays, um, we will tr we will tend to call it special interests, or like I said more recently, I heard passionate interests. But again, what it means is those really, really, really strong interests. Try to incorporate them into the social story, into the cognitive restructuring, into the exposures themselves. Okay. So for one girl I work with who was afraid of pigs, I, I, know, I mean she loved pigs. Pigs were her special interests. Everything was pigs. Instead of earning brave bucks, she earned brave pig bucks, <laughs> which were the pic, which looked like little pictures of a pig jumping off a diving board. Everything we talked about, how can you be a brave pig? You know, that was like her mantra, being a brave pig, you know, because she loved pigs so much. Um, another example of incorporating a special interest into an exposure itself was uh, for a child I worked with who uh, was very, a child with autism who was... Um, I think he's seven at the time and he had seizures. So he frequently went to the doctor, was very, very afraid of the doctor. And it took several doctors and nurses to hold him down each time. What we do know is restraining is never a good way to go. Obviously restraining is going to make a kid even more afraid. That's what's going to be really traumatizing for a kid is to know, oh my goodness, you know, every time I go to the doctor or a dentist, I'm restrained. That's terrifying, right? So what we did for this kid is, you know, and sometimes it really takes hitting upon what is the strongest or most powerful special interest or reinforcer. For this kid, M&Ms aren't gonna cut it. A favorite video wasn't gonna cut it. We really brainstormed with parents and they re remembered that this child used to be obsessed with potato head to the point where he was so obsessed with it that they had to take it away from him. So for this child, um, we said, you know what? We're gonna bring back potato head but he's gonna live at the doctor's office, nowhere else. So again, the, can't, the child can't get potato head in any other context, just at the doctor's office. So the first time we had him go to the doctor's office, we kept saying, you're gonna get potato head there, you're gonna get potato head. And we just had him go into the doctor's office and play with potato head in the examining room. Again, no shots, no blood tests, no medical procedures. We were just trying to pair something he was really afraid of, pair the doctor's office with something highly, highly, highly positive, the most positive thing, so that it created a positive association with the doctor's office instead of an afraid association, right? Um, a dad I was working with recently, I like how he put it. He said, so you're trying to make it as attractive as possible. Yes. We are trying to make the doctor's office as attractive as possible is, is one way to look at it for sure. And so pair the most positive thing you could think of with their fear. So in this case, the doctor's office. So the first child time, like I said, he just went to the doctor's office and didn't have to do anything other than play with potato head. The next time, the second time when he went into the examining room, we said, okay, get up on the examining table and then you can play with potato head. So then all he had to do, again, no medical procedures, all he had to do was sit on the examining table and play with potato head. Um, the next time the doctor did a little bit more, I think looked in his ears, maybe looked in, I, I can't remember exactly, but he did, a, he actually did examine him a bit. By the fourth time, this kid was actually getting blood tests or shots or actual procedures withholding potato head, but didn't actually care. The potato head was so powerful that it really overcame or counteracted his anxiety. Rarely has anything, has anything ever been as effective as Potato Head was in that situation, to be honest. But if you can find something that is that powerful, it can often really help to overpower or counteract the anxiety, okay? Um, I can keep going, or would you like me to stop for questions now with our last 10 minutes?
I think we can start answering some questions. What do you mean? That's fine. I'm sorry, there's a lot more I could say in terms of strategies, but I, I also, you know, it, it is complicated, but I do want to make sure I leave time to address people's questions. Yeah. Yeah, and some questions are going to be coming up. So if you want to look in Q&A. Okay, I'll um, also the chat, the Q&A, okay. Q&A, uh, okay. okay. And I'm still working on translation some questions. Okay. So let me let me get to some of these questions in the chat. So first question, can parents provide CBT for their child? How can they get supervision in this therapy? Um, so, uh, uh, you know, it, yes, you can. Is it easier if you find a professional to help you out with it? Absolutely. And of course, some cases might be so complicated that you are going to need the help of a professional. Um, myself, I'm a professional, obviously, and have expertise in CBT, but it's still a struggle with my own child. It really is. It really is. Both of my, I have an eight year old and a three year old, and my eight year old has OCD and a lot of anxiety. And it has been a struggle, you know, uh, because you are emotionally involved as a parent. And your tendency as a parent is to want to rescue your child and to help them avoid and to say, it, it's hard to see your child upset. So it really, your tendency as a parent is always to be saying, oh, no, you don't have to do that. Or let me rescue you. Or to say, no, you're not going to get sick. Or sure, you're afraid of the dog. Let's leave this place. It has a dog, right? So it is hard as a parent. You know, I, I think um, certainly I do really help my child to confront her fears. Um, but, you know, there's a... I think what I've learned as a parent is, is you can't die on every hill, so to speak. You know what I mean? There are some times I just have to say, okay, maybe I'll accommodate that anxiety because there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff, you know, and we can't target it all as parents or we're going to go crazy. So sometimes I say, okay, I'm going to target the fear of winter coats right now because that's our priority. It's really cold outside <laughs> and maybe I'll let these other things slide, you know, because we can't target every single thing as a parent or else we'll go crazy, you know? But, uh, but I think you can do it, you know, and be gentle with yourself. You know, we're not going to get everything right. Um, but an example I was just giving my class the other day is, so my daughter's always had a major fear of, of different types of clothing. Like a lot of kids on the spectrum do different clothings have a lot of different sensory issues. So, um, but in particular winter coats was always one of her biggest challenges. And so I remember each year we would encounter a one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, every year would be the same thing when it would turn cold. And, you know, I think, I think one time when she was three, I forgot just the first day was freezing. I don't know how I forgot, but I put a, I tried to put a coat on her in my apartment building and she just had a complete meltdown to the point where people were coming out of their apartments and yelling at me. So, and I remember blaming myself and saying, oh, I should have anticipated this, but you know what? It was a bad day. And I just had to pick myself up and say, okay, I will go into this with all my strategies tomorrow. So that night when we got home, I practiced putting on the coats with her. I used a lot of rewards. I prepared her for it. I read a social story. Um, I gave her choices. Do you want to wear this coat or this coat? I really tried to use all my strategies. I incorporated her special interests. Uh, we're going to put on a coat. We're going to fight Maleficent. We're going to be brave like Sleeping Beauty and put on this coat. And the next day, you know, we started early. I didn't, I made sure we weren't rushing to school. I did a lot of preparation and I used her most powerful rewards. You know, I can't remember what they were at the time, but like maybe it was showing her a video on my phone. I think she got to watch a video on my phone, which I never let her do on the way to school. If she put on that coat, I think that's what it was. It's hard to remember at this point. And then it went well the second day. So you, you're going to have bad days. It's going to be hard. It's not easy, but I think you can do this as a parent. Um, you know, you, you just have to remember to really try to make sure that kid's motivated. If you're using that reward for other things, it's not going to be powerful. I think there's that tendency of parents or teachers to when you find a reward that works, you want to use it for everything. Oh, this video on my phone works or this lollipop works. So I want to use it for everything. But when you do that, it will lose its power. You have to reserve the most powerful reward for the thing that is the toughest situation for you, for the thing that really makes your kid anxious. Okay. Um, and in terms of uh, getting supervision in this therapy, I'm going to skip over a lot of this. I'm sorry. I wish I had time to go through all this, but go look at my resources at the end. Um, so if you buy these books and go to these websites, I think these will be helpful resources for you. Um, for therapists, they can go to what's called Maya 
Um, this provides clinical training for clinicians who are working with youth on the spectrum. Perhaps you can complete it yourself as a parent. There's also virtual training available on facing your fears, and they have virtual groups for kids and their parents. You can also um, go to the Facing Your Fear websites as well. Okay. Um, okay. Next. Wonderful. Uh, I'm here. Next questions is uh, as for life. Okay. Uh, child of I think child afraid of darkness, what kind of recommendation would you give for the exposure therapy? Yeah. Um, so like I said, you want to, um, uh, fear of dark is really common, right? Um, you want to um, teach that you can make a recording that that child listens to where they're saying, I can be brave in the dark. I'm a brave boy. I'm a brave girl. I can take care of myself in the dark. You can even teach them belly breathing. You can teach them to think of happy thoughts while they're laying there and practice it with them. Do a lot of practice. So we're going to do a brave challenge where we're going to go in your room together and we're going to be in the dark for 30 seconds. And now we're going to be in the dark for a minute. And now we're going to be in the dark for five minutes. Or maybe if you have a dimmer in your child's room, you could gradually dim it more and more and more each night till it's uh, darker. So you're working on brave challenges Think about it like levels of a video game. You're not just expecting your child to be okay in pitch black, but you're helping helping them do brave challenges and be motivated to be exposed to the dark for longer and longer periods of time um, with, or, or, or have it be gradually darker and darker, right? Um, maybe you could give them a nightlight. A nightlight that has their special interests is an even greater way to go. If you can find a nightlight that's their special interest, a Harry Potter nightlight or a unicorn nightlight or whatever it is, and say, oh, you're such a brave girl. You know, you're, you're sleeping with the lights off tonight and it's, we're giving you this special unicorn nightlight to really help you be brave. Um, in all of those instances when none of that works, I've had some success with, again, recordings where the kid maybe listens to their favorite song in the dark. Um, or some other kind of coping tool like that. Um, there's been other times the parent has sat next to the kid while they're falling asleep with the dark and gradually will move the parent's chair farther and farther away from the bed until the parent's chair is in the doorway, until the parent's chair is out of the room, et cetera, so that the child is going to sleep on their own, okay? Um, we have it as a questions. Um, sorry for my not a very good uh, translation. I was just like copying and pasting questions. So, thirteen years old child autistic um, was since he was under occupation. Their parents and the child was able to evacuate, but after the shielding, the child having a constant panic attacks and meltdown. She's not going out. What are the guys yeah. you've given for volunteers? Uh, and it's so many children in this situation. So this child was recent, uh, recently evacuated from her son, yeah. as I remember. Um, and so this is a child who's still in the Ukraine and still there's um, shelling going it's, on? Um, or they're, they're located to a safer she's, location? She, she located, the child is located in a safer location. Okay. Because, right. I mean, to be honest, if there is shelling, you know, I mean, that, that really is quite reasonable that they're scared to go out if they're still shelling. I understand they might have to. But I think, um, again, you know, it really makes sense that so many of these kids, whether they have autism or not, would be traumatized after going through such a traumatic experience. So, again, I want to normalize this for you. Anybody would be afraid. Anybody would be afraid if, if that's what they'd been through. That said, I do understand that as a parent, you need to take your child out. I get it. You need to go get food. You need to go do stuff. I understand you can't stay home all the time and that you do have to get your child out of the door. So what can we do? Again, you know, same sort of thing. Teach your child some coping self-talk. Um, maybe it can be we're in a safe place now. There's not going to be any shelling when we go outside. Maybe they're not going to understand that. So maybe it can be as simple as I can do it. I can be brave. I can go outside, just like their favorite character. Again, try to really try to frame everything to be consistent with their special interests, if you can. Um, and again, try to do these exposures little by little. So don't just expect that you're just gonna take your child out and go to the store. Try to do a little exposure to, okay, you know what? We're gonna, our brave challenge today is we're just gonna go sit on the porch for a minute and we're gonna eat our favorite snack out on the porch for a minute, right? And tomorrow we're gonna to go out on the porch for two minutes. And the next day we're gonna go out on the porch for three minutes. And maybe the next day we'll go a little farther than the porch. We'll sit in the front yard for five minutes. 
while eating our favorite snack and listening to our favorite music. Okay, now fifth day, we're gonna go outside for 10 minutes, um, you know, and go a little farther away from our house, maybe sit on the bench on the street um, for 10 minutes and eat our favorite snack, listen to our favorite songs. So try to work your kid up little by little by little, again, to doing harder and harder exposures outside until you're getting them to the location you need to get them. But again, start small, go slow, be gentle with yourself, be gentle with your kid. You're not going to get them to the grocery store maybe on day one, you know? You have to gradually build up their coping and build up their tolerance for increasingly kind of difficult situations. Um, does that make sense? But like I said, pair the situation with as many positive things with you can. So if you're trying to get them to the grocery store, the reward is maybe they get to pick out a favorite candy at the end in the grocery store. Uh, one of my children was obsessed with credit cards, love them. So his reward at the end of the grocery store was he got to swipe the credit card himself. So think about how can we make it more of a fun place? What can we do to make this more motivating? The grocery store itself, I'm just using the grocery store as an example. Uh, can they help you pick out your groceries? Can they wheel the cart? Um, if they have a favorite song, let's listen to that favorite song. For one child who had a favorite song, we only let him listen to the favorite song on his Walkman or iPod when we were running errands and when we were outside the house just to get him outside, for example. And we only let him have his favorite snacks when he was outside the house, not inside the house. So think about what can you do to make outside more attractive and inside less attractive. Does that make sense? Because again, the more positive things your child will associate with outside, the easier it will become to get him or her outside. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Okay. Next questions. Um, translators from Russian. What kind of recommendation do you give for uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for autistic kids, age, IQ, etc.? Do, do there are any minimum requirements that we can use this cognitive behavioral therapy with this kids, or we can use it with this kids? What is your ideas and your experience so the, the the all the randomized control trials like i was mentioning before that use all of this cognitive behavioral therapy they do exclude kids typically with an iq below 75 or 80. however so like i said the cognitive components sometimes cannot be used with children with an intellectual disability however we still do graduated exposure and we still do positive reinforcement so just to kind of like walk you through all these three examples were, were kids who had an intellectual disability. Um, so for one of my children, he was afraid of um, happy birthday, for example, really afraid of happy birthday. Um, and again, he, he had a pretty severe cognitive disability and ve very, very minimal language, but we were able to incorporate his special interests. He was again, terrified of birthdays. He would always run out of the house or run out of the classroom or run out of the restaurant if anyone was singing happy birthday. But his special interest was Sesame Street. So we couldn't do any cognitive restructuring really with him. The best we could do to kind of approximate co cognitive restructuring was show him a lot of videos of his favorite characters singing happy birthday. So we, again, he was obsessed with Sesame Street. That was his special interest. So we showed him Elmo's birthday fun DVD. We showed him a YouTube video of Bert and Ernie singing happy birthday. Um, so was, we conceptualize that as sort of like psychoed or cognitive restructuring in a way of normalizing happy birthday, in a way of trying to help him cope with it and showing him it was safe. We rehearsed happy birthday with a pretend birthday cake with light up candles before we did it with a real cake. We exposed him gradually to the cake with candles in it unlit before we eventually lit the candles. Um, we incorporated his special interest into the birthday cake itself. So we had his favorite Sesame Street characters on the birthday cake. We used Sesame Street candles. So again, it was making the cake and the birthday experience itself more appealing. And his favorite toy was this Sesame Street pop-up toy. So again, we did not give it to him at any other time of day in any other location. We only brought the Sesame Street pop-up toy out when we started singing happy birthday and lit the candles on the cake. Does that make sense? And at first we just paired it with the cake non-contingently. So every time we started singing happy birthday and walked in the room, we didn't 
didn't make him approach the cake or anything. He would just be somewhere in the room. We would just come in the room with the birthday cake singing happy birthday and right away give him the Sesame Street pop-up toy so that he was associating happy birthday with the Sesame Street pop-up toy. After a few days, then we started trying to get him to approach the cake. So again, we didn't force him to approach the cake. We would just say, come blow out the candles and then you could get your Sesame Street pop-up toy. We didn't care if he actually blew out the candles. We were just trying to get him to approach the cake. So after day three or day four, I don't remember what it was. We started saying, you know, come blow out the candles and then you could get Sesame Street pop-up toy. So again, on his own, he was so motivated by wanting Sesame Street pop-up toy that he approached the cake and tried to blow out the candles. And right away we gave him the Sesame Street pop-up toy. After like two, two, three weeks of that, he didn't even need the Sesame Street pop-up toy anymore. He wasn't afraid of the birthday cake anymore and was independently approaching and trying to blow out the candles on his own. And to this day, several years later, he is no longer afraid of birthday cakes or happy birthday. We didn't force him to approach the cake, but one thing, more thing I do wanna say is we did use some form of extinction, which means not reinforcing the escape anymore in that we did um, lock the doors to the house so we couldn't run out of the house anymore. But that's also a safety risk. You don't want a kid running out of the house, okay? <laughs> that's also a safety risk. But to some extent, we were increasing his exposure. Again, we didn't force him to approach the cake or sit. we didn't hold him next to the cake, but he could no longer run out of the house anymore, okay? D does that answer your question? So again, all of that was how we would use all of these kind of treatment strategies with a child with autism who also had an intellectual disability and minimal language. Next question is kind of tough, Lauren. Translated from Russian, okay. A child is six years old. After relocation, child involved in self-stimulatory behavior, including touching your private parts. So child is steaming using touching your private parts. Six years old, female. This became a problem because a uh, child uh, does this behavior during a school and uh, anxiety is spiking and this is a coping tool. Mm -hmm. Parents are horrified. So a few things. So there's a few things. First of all, this is really kind of a whole separate talk. This isn't really treating anxiety. So it's hard to give a, a, a quick answer to this. Self-stimulatory behavior is a whole different talk you're making the assumption this kid's doing it because they're anxious and they might be, it's possible. But a lot of kids with autism do this just because it feels good. It's a very common behavior, right? So that's a whole nother kind of set of treatments we would tend to use. But the general gist of it is, is a, a few things I would just suggest is that again, you know, it's normal. Um, Self-stimulatory behavior is normal. Masturbation is normal. Um, so we don't want to um, pathologize it or stigmatize the child or make shame them at all in any way. But obviously you don't want the child doing this in class in front of other children. So what I would say is, can we encourage a replacement behavior um, such as uh, playing with Play-Doh, um, um, touching a fiddle in the room, you know, some sort of fidget item, right? Give them something else to do with their hands instead is what I would try to suggest without calling attention to the masturbation per se. If none of that works, what you can do is when the child starts engaging that, uh, instead prompt them to ask to go to the bathroom so at least they're doing it in a private place versus in the class. Because um, again, you know, the biggest thing is you don't want them obviously doing that in front of other children. But ideally you can try to find other activities to redirect them towards that can also serve some sort of stealth stimulatory purpose, not the same as masturbation, obviously. Um, but if it is truly anxiety relieving, some other anxiety relieving activity, whether that's progressive muscle relaxation or belly breathing, or again, playing with fidget toys, um, doing drawing, um, doing something else, give them something else to do to replace that behavior. You don't just wanna say, stop doing that, right? Because what's the kid gonna do instead? give the child something else to do instead. But another thing I wanna emphasize is that even though this might serve a self stimulatory function or purpose, often what happens is it also comes to serve a secondary attention purpose in that often parents or teachers start yelling at the kid or freaking out and giving it a lot of attention. So then the kid also starts doing it as a way to get attention. That's what you don't want to happen. So you don't want to yell, you don't want to scream, you don't want to freak out, you don't want to react, right? When you see the child engaging in masturbation, you just want to, again, like I said, 
Don't call a lot of attention to it. Don't react strongly. Just try to redirect them to another activity in a way that is not giving it an overly amount of attention. Does that make sense? Like I said, this, this is a whole talk in and of itself, but that would be my quick, quick answer. Okay. Thank you so much, Lauren. It's like, as you see from my translation, I mentioned uh, parents uh, or whatever, somebody was reporting a reaction. So uh, next questions. Kids seven years old touch or scratches his face when he feels nervous. How can we stop this reaction? Well, I don't, I mean, again, this is a kind of complicated answer. First of all, I, I think a lot of times parents jump to the conclusion that they're touching or scratching their face when they're anxious, but it may not be the case at all. So we often have to do a thorough functional behavior assessment to try to figure out why is the child touching or scratching his face? What need is this meeting for the child and figure out a replacement behavior skill we can teach that child so that he can get his needs met in another way. But let's assume it is for anxiety. Like I said, the big question would be, what's this kid anxious about, right? So you have to treat the anxiety and to whatever they're afraid of in the way I was describing today, right? So if there's touching or scratching their face because there's a birthday cake or when there's a birthday, you would expose them to happy birthday in the way I just described. If they're touching or scratching their face because they're um, nervous when they have to meet new people, you want to help them say, I can be brave a brave boy or girl when meeting a new person, I can handle this, I can do it, and help them do lots of brave challenges to meeting new people in increasingly more challenging examples, right? And give them huge rewards for um, facing their fears and doing it calmly, right? Without scratching their face. So again, I think, you know, there's no universal strategy. Here's what you do to touch or scratch the face. You just have to figure out what's causing their anxiety, what's causing them to feel nervous. And then treating that trigger, treating the thing they're afraid of or treating the source of the anxiety in the way that I described in this presentation. Does that make sense? But again, you also want to make sure you're overly reacting to it because then it can also start to serve a secondary function of gaining attention. So you want to make sure you are not again, giving it an overly amount of attention, but that you are trying to figure out how can we get that child to get his needs met. So again, one of the best things you can do is teach that kid a form of communication. So for example, one child was scratching himself and scratching other people when there was a girl in his class who would start to cry because that sound of the girl crying was very, very anxiety provoking to him. So whenever the kid scratched himself or scratched the girl, the teachers would take him out of the classroom and put him in the break room. So what did this kid learn? Every time I scratch myself, I get to leave what makes me anxious. I get to leave this girl screaming, right? So again, we had to expose the child to the sounds of crying in increasingly more challenging amounts. So first just YouTube videos of kids crying at low volumes and we gradually turned it louder and louder and louder until it was actually a video of this girl crying. But also we taught this kid to ask for a break. We gave this kid some control. We gave him break cards and we let him know that, okay, when you hand a break card, you can go to the break area and get a break from this crying so that he didn't need to resort to scratching anymore to get his needs met. Over time, we reduced the number of break cards gradually and increased the volume of all the exposures to the crying so that we were helping him gradually over time to cope with the crime. So again, you have to kind of figure out what is the source of this touching or scratching? What is it he's afraid of? How can we help him expose him to this? And how can we give him a form of communication so that he could get his needs met in another way and not have to resort to touching or scratching his face? Thank you so much. Next question. Uh, how, we, how can we present and, and utilize some of the student strategy to incorporate in a school where incident at school has caused the anxiety to be heightened? Um, I don't, I think I would need more information. I, I don't know if I'm understanding that question. Um, I don't know what the incidents in the school are, so I, I'm not, I don't really know how to answer that question. Um, I think it would depend what the incidents in school are. You know, if there's an incident at the school that's causing the child to be afraid, you need to treat that incident, right? So if the kid's getting bullied, you can't just teach that child, okay, you know, 
be brave, don't be afraid of bullies, you have to address the bullying. You have to make sure that the kid who's bullying that kid isn't bullying the kid anymore and that the teacher is intervening, right? So, so I think it really depends. If, if the child's afraid of tests, you know, and that's what's causing the child to have anxiety at school, you would have to help them expose them to taking tests and increasingly more challenging situations and teach them coping talks such as I can do this. I've never failed to fail the test before. I probably won't fail the test again, but if I do, it's not the end of the world. So, you know, if the child's afraid of school because people are singing happy birthday in school, you'd have to use the interventions I described on this slide, for example. So, you know, I, I really think it depends on what it is they're afraid of at school. I'm not really sure what those incidents are, but whatever the incident is, you, you would need to gradually expose them to the incident unless it's something that's unsafe to do. So like if it's bullying, you obviously don't gradually expose the kid to bullying, you would have to stop the bullying, you know? But assuming it's something that the kid really shouldn't be afraid of, like not bullying, but something like happy birthday or a test or something, then you gradually expose them to, to, to those things they're afraid of. Uh, Lauren, we have some clarification, physical assault incidents. Well, in, in that case, you obviously wouldn't want to expose the child to physical assault. You know, you, I mean, you would need to stop the physical assault. So I'm not, again, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question because the child shouldn't be putting in a, putting it, be put in a situation like that where they're being physically insulted. In a case like that, they shouldn't be going to school and put in a classroom where they're physically assaulted by another peer. The kid who needs to be treated is the kid who's doing the physically assaulting. I would encourage in that situation, the child needs to be, have their classes moved or, or again, they need to, you know, remove the child who is doing the physically insulting and do the intervention with that child. Does that make sense? You know, um, I mean, that is not an okay situation to expect a kid to be okay with. That's, this isn't an issue of, oh, the child's afraid or anxious, how can we treat that fear or anxiety? That's a question of this child's in an inappropriate situation. The child shouldn't be in a situation where they're expected to tolerate being assaulted. Right? Yes, yeah, thank you so much, them. Lauren. That's not a situation they should be in. That's not appropriate. Absolutely, I am absolutely agree with you in this. Okay. It's like safety is a main basic need for the kids. <sighs> absolutely. Okay, next question. A mm -hmm. uh, uh, child is seven years old with uh, ACD, autism spectrum disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, has a fear of social situation. Parents also have OCD. General recommendation and guidelines. Can I rephrase in some way what we would do if we have a child with increased anxiety and we have a parent with anxiety too? I mean, it's the, it's the same. It's the same as what I've described. All the things that I just explained today, you're explaining to the child and the parent. You're treating them both together, right? So often, usually the parents are anxious too. Usually, you know, not always, but usually anxious kids, anxious parents tend to have anxious kids, you know? Um, maybe we're not afraid of the same things, but almost every case of a child who's afraid of something, often their parents have fears of things too. So um, we, we try to encourage parents to go through the same things they're expecting of their child. So the girl with, um, I was talking about before, the girl with autism who's afraid of hair dryers, her dad's also really afraid of dogs. So, you know, we're encouraging him to use these same strategies himself to overcome his fear of dogs and to model that for his kid so that he, is showing his kid, look, I can be brave too. Too often parents think they have to be what we call mastery models, models of perfection. Parents think they're not supposed to act afraid in front of their kids. No, you're supposed to act afraid in front of your kids, but you're supposed to show them how you face your fears and how you overcome your anxiety. You're supposed to be a coping model, model not a mastery model. I remember once a mom said to me, with a mom of an anxious child we were working with said, oh, we went skiing this weekend. I was so afraid, but I didn't want to tell her I was afraid. No, that would have been a great example to say, I'm really afraid of this, but look, I'm doing it anyway. I'm facing my fears. I'm trying something new. This is really hard for me and I'm really afraid, but I'm telling myself I can do this. I can be brave, right? So be a coping model for your kids. So we, I often treat the parents and the kids anxiety together. Like I'll you know, I'm thinking of a kid who had a fear of toothpaste once and the mom was afraid of heights and we were doing both together. In a session, the mom would be a, 
you know, we'd doing we'd be doing a little height exposure for her first. And so the kid would get to watch the mom facing her own fears before he faced his own fears of toothpaste and anything creamy, you know? So often again, we're it's it's the same. You know, we're doing these same strategies with the parent and the kid to help them learn that they can both overcome it. Um the ADHD is a whole separate story. Uh, you know, like I said, it, it can make it a bit harder. I don't think the strategies would be any different. It, it could just be a bit harder for the kid to focus maybe. But um, with the fear of social situations, again, you're just trying to increasingly expose the child to social situations. It depends what those social situations are. Um, for some kids, it's texting. So we might start out texting someone who's not scary or phone calls. We might start out making phone calls to grandma or grandpa or cousin before we work on making phone calls to a classmate. Sometimes um, with one of my children who was afraid of social situations, he was most afraid of ordering in stores, um, but he was not as afraid. And he was also afraid of answering questions in class. So again, we really worked on things that were a little bit easier for him first, like uh, maybe, um, saying hello to another kid in class, gradually answering a teacher's question, ultimately working on asking a question. We would go do exposures, we'd walk into stores where he'd have to order in the store. First he was whispering, um, eventually he was talking loudly and we would give him really strong rewards, you know, his favorite treats, his favorite toys, he was earning brave bucks um, for doing these exposures to, to social situations. Uh, a lot of times kids with social anxiety are afraid of being embarrassed. So I say, you know what? We're gonna do exposures to being anxious, uh, embarrassed to show you nothing bad's gonna happen. I will walk in a restaurant with them or walk in a store and I will slip and fall on purpose and show them, oh, wow, that was really embarrassing. And look, I lived through it, I'm okay. And I'll have them do it too, to see it's okay to be embarrassed. We can cope with that. We can live with it. Everyone's embarrassed sometimes. Make sense? A girl with autism. Yes once was afraid of singing in her chorus recital. She was afraid, what if I mess up? What if everyone laughs at me? And her coping thoughts we helped her think about were, you know, have other people ever messed up? Have I ever laughed at them? Do I care? Do I even notice? What are the odds someone even hear or notice if I messed up? And even if I did mess up and they did notice, would they really laugh at me? Would they probably really do that? Probably not. And even if they did and the worst happened, would it kill me? No. You know, we worked on having her sing and I would practice laughing at her to show her it was okay. You know, so same strategy, same guidance, whatever it is you're afraid of, expose yourself to it. Do these brave challenges, no matter what it is, you can cope with it. Thank you so much. Absolutely love it. Um, next questions. Child afraid to separate from attached caregiver. Separation anxiety. Yeah, I should have probably added separate slides. I mean, I, I can even add and send you separate slides on um, some example exposures for separation anxiety, some example exposures for social anxiety, but same thing. Gradually expose your child to separation, little and little. So with like the, uh, this was a child who was afraid of separation anxiety. He, you know, he was upset when his parents would leave the house. So we wrote him a social story on, it's okay if my parents leave, they'll leave and they always come back. Um, um, his favorite things were the Muppet movies and playing with this toy. And so again, first we had his parents leave the house just to walk to the mailbox and back and leave him with his uncle or his grandparents. We made the exposures gradually longer and longer so that they were driving around the block and coming back. You know, we'd go from just one minute of them leaving to five minutes of them leaving to 10 minutes of them leaving. We gradually made the exposures longer and longer. But while his parents left, he got access to his favorite things, which were the Muppet movie, and, the, and this map desk, I think was called, and he didn't get access to those favorite things at any other time. They were only saved for when his parents would leave. And his special interest was this um, Kailan, the, this character. So he carried around a sign that said, I can be brave like Kailan. Kailan says, I can do it, I can be brave. So when his parents would leave, he would carry around this Kailan and he was always saying, you know, I can do it. I can be brave like Kailan. My parents will be back. I can be a brave boy. And in this story, we had a picture of his parents leaving and saying, bye-bye, we'll be back soon. You know, So again, we rehearsed it, we practiced it. We at first pretended his parents were leaving. We'd have them walk right out of the house and come right back. And we gradually made it longer and longer and longer to again, really get him used to that 
those brave challenges. And when his parents would come back, they would bring him a big reward for being brave while they were gone. Okay, make sense? And we have a last question. What we can do if child is afraid to go to the shelter? We can give encouragement under, under this condition. It turns out we will push kids to strive to shelter even without need. What can we do? I asked somebody to help with translation, so let me read in uh, Russian again what was okay. original questions, okay? Sure. So, yeah, I don't, I don't so think I can... I yes, yes, yes. Okay. The child is afraid to go to the shelter and we cannot give uh, any reinforcements in this condition so it's uh, looking like um it's, go it's looking like that we're doing everything that the child will go there uh when he doesn't need to go there that was the original question S i i don't understand the part that's um it turns out we will push kids to strive to shelter you without need like if the child doesn't need to go to the shelter don't make him go to the shelter obviously but if he does need to go to the shelter it sounds like what they're asking is that they don't have any material reinforcers they can give him. Obviously, you know, material reinforcers, whether it's toys or treats can be really helpful, but I really encourage you to think about what reinforcers can we give even when you don't have any material reinforcers. What is rewarding to this kid, right? So do they have a favorite song we can sing that we will sing when they're going to a shelter? A lot of kids have a favorite topic to talk about. We will talk about that favorite thing when we're going to the shelter. Um, one of my kids is literally obsessed with names, talking about names. So we, I will recite the names of every single person I can think of, the first, middle, last names as the reward while we're walking to the shelter and going in the shelter. There are free rewards you can think of that usually involve their special interests. Talking about their favorite things that you wouldn't normally do, listening to their favorite songs perhaps that you wouldn't normally do, singing their favorite songs, doing a favorite dance. Um, we're doing a preservative behavior with them. One of my children, one of his uh, repetitive behavior was to go one, two, three. A lot of times people would try to get him to stop doing that because it looked weird. What I would say is do it with him. I did it with him and that was really rewarding to the kid. Do it with him if he goes in the shelter. So say, you know, when we were walking into the shelter, or once we get in the shelter, I'm going to do one, two, you know, three with you, right? So those are rewards you can use that don't involve any toys or treats. Think about what the kid's special interest is, what their repetitive behaviors are. Do that thing with them, um, contingent upon going into the shelter, okay, is, is what I would advise. Okay, I have a last question. It was in a chat, so I'm... I'm gonna put it in a second in a Q and A. Uh, please tell me how to help a teenager who had a depression before they were incurred, but after evacuation to Latvia, a strong self harm began. Um, so it's uh, as I understand, as autistic teenagers with um, both uh, previously diagnosed uh, depressions, and now he is in a foreign country with like some difficulties to access. Uh, mental health and other services. Right, so I, I do wanna say depression is a whole separate topic though. Depression is not the same as treating fear or anxiety. So I, I can't think of a way I can really quickly answer this question to be honest, because treating depression is a whole separate topic. Um, but obviously, you know, what I would say is just safety wise, try to make sure you're monitoring the child so they're not engaging in self-harm or, or suicidal attempts the main treatment for very quickly, the main treatment for depression is what we call behavioral activation, which means try to get the kid active. When someone's depressed, they just wanna stay home and stay in bed and don't do anything. So figure out what is it this kid likes. When they're depressed, they probably don't feel like they like anything, but what is it this kid used to like doing? Even can it be taking a bath or listening to a favorite song or getting them out for a walk? Maybe they don't want to go out for a walk, but let's say, all right, listen, let's listen to your favorite song on the iPad while we take a walk and you can't listen to this at any other time. Get the kid active, um, get the kid engaged in as many activities as you can would be the quickest answer I could give. But like I said, treating depression can be really hard um, and treating self-harm could be really hard. Um, that's the treatment for self-harm is something we call dialect, dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT. 
That's usually the main evidence-based treatment for kids who are self-harming. Um, but, but the short answer would be try to figure out why the kid's self-harming and give them another way to get their needs met. So if they're self-harming for your attention, try to give them a better way to get attention. If they're self-harming because they are trying to escape doing something they don't want to do, like going to school or, 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 or doing an activity they want to do, um, try to give them another way to say, I want to break from this. I don't want to do this. So they don't need to self-harm. If the kid is self-harming because they feel too much and it's the only thing that can make them feel less, try to give them another strategy to help them feel less, whether that's exercising or taking a bath or holding an ice cube in their hand or um, running up and down the stairs. I don't know. I'm just spitballing here, sucking on a lemon, <laughs> you know, um, try to give them something else to snap them out of that urge in that minute to make them feel less if they're feeling too much and they want to feel less. Okay. If they're feeling nothing and they want to feel something, which is another reason kids self-harm, try to give them another way to make them feel something, right? Like I said, for some kids that can be holding an ice cube, listening to a song, sucking on a lemon, um, just some way to engage their senses and make them feel something instead of nothing. But like I said, that is a really complicated topic, a really challenging thing to treat. So that's just my initial, um, my initial ideas. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and I think we are done. I don't okay. see any more questions and we did a good timing. All right. So thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you, everybody. And that's it all. Um, I saw the question about uh, webinars. Webinars, recorded webinars will be available on the website. Um, and see you later in the next right. year. Bye, Jenna. Bye, bye, Daria. Good to see you guys. All right. Bye. Bye. Crystal, you can.